A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm glad that you're with us on the program today. Coming up, in addition to our uh, armed citizen story of the day, our recidivist report, and our good deed of the day, we're going to uh, delve into the uh, comments by an Illinois congressman who says, we have too many guns out there, and uh, he thinks he knows what to do about that. Yeah. Now, listen, before we get started on that, I, I do just have one note. Uh, you know, one of the things that I kind of... I kind of struggle with it, honestly, on a, uh, a daily basis here. There are times where I'll write something for BarionArms.com, and then I think, I kind of want to talk about it, but I don't want to, you know, double post something. So um, I, I do have a piece at Barion Arms right now separating fact from fiction in the Breonna Taylor case, and I would strongly encourage you to read it. If you feel inclined, please share it. There, There is so much misinformation that is flying around out there on both sides, by the way. Uh, and I hate I hate it that it's happened on both sides, but but really, uh, it is. You've got people who are saying, "Well, you know, uh, the cops went to the wrong house." No, they they didn't. Uh, Brianna Taylor's name and address on, on a search warrant that was executed by police officers. Uh, and then I've seen on the other side of the coin, uh, "Well, you, you know, her, her boyfriend's at fault there. I mean, he shouldn't have shot at cops." Well, the boyfriend's story, Kenneth Walker's story, has been consistent from. Pretty much day one that uh, he and Brianna Taylor were in bed watching TV. They heard loud booms coming from the front door, but they did not hear police announce themselves. They didn't know what was going on. Kenneth Walker said he thought that they were getting ready to be broken into. So he grabbed his gun, walked towards the front door. And as the door, he said, came off the hinges, that's when he fired a shot. Uh, And officers, rightfully thinking that, uh, that they were under attack, fired back. And Brianna Taylor was shot and killed. Uh, while standing in the doorway between the bedroom and into the living room area. So you got folks who are saying that, you know, Brianna Taylor was killed in her sleep. Uh, you got people saying that uh, Kenneth Walker was actually named on the search warrant. He wasn't. There was a guy named Adrian Walker, no relation to Kenneth Walker, uh, who was part of that drug investigation. No drugs, by the way, were ever found in Brianna Taylor's apartment. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally, what what makes me uh, tend to believe Kenneth Walker's uh, version of events, that that he believed he was acting in self-defense, and obviously police believe they were acting in self-defense, is that there was no reason for Kenneth Walker to actually open fire on cops. He wasn't wanted. He didn't have a criminal history. He was a legal gun owner. There were no drugs in the home. There was no reason. There was no motivation for Kenneth Walker to just randomly uh, open fire on police officers, knowing that they were police officers. By the way, he fired a single shot. So the you know again I'm seeing this uh, the, these competing narratives develop here, uh, and there was one tweet that really struck with me uh, last night, and it, I couldn't tell you who said it, but it was uh, if you want to be angry at somebody, be angry at Kenneth Walker. He he killed his girlfriend. What if, what if, anger isn't the appropriate response here? What if grief and sorrow? And sadness is the appropriate response. Why can it not be, again, that there are no easy villains to be found in this case? And then instead what you have is a tragedy. Where again, both sides believing they were acting in self-defense, fired upon one another, and Breonna Taylor died. Based on the evidence that has been made available, it seems like that is the most likely scenario that happened. But it also seems to me to be the scenario that isn't really being talked about much. So, again, I'm not going to take up the entire show on this. uh, But, again, at DeBarionArms.com, separating fact from fiction in the Breonna Taylor case, check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, In the meantime, let's talk about Congressman Sean Caston, shall we? If the name sounds familiar, he's been in the news uh, a little bit uh, over the past couple of months. But uh, most recently, he was doing a, uh, an interview with a, a newspaper there in Illinois, uh, and he said, we have too many guns. He was talking to the Daily Herald editorial board. And uh, he said, if we pass all of the greatest laws in the world, the guns are still out there. So we've got to do something about that. Now, he didn't say what those greatest laws in the world would be. He has called for a new ban on semi-automatic firearms. He uh, says he wants universal background checks. 
He's back red flag laws. He uh, proposed legislation, federally speaking, that would make it a federal crime to not report a firearm lost or stolen within 48 hours of it being stolen, which is supposedly an anti-trafficking mechanism. But it's not because, again, if <laughs> if you're, let's say, let's say, for example, that um, you engage in a criminal straw purchase. You buy a gun for somebody who's not legally eligible to own one. You give it to them. What's to stop you from indemnifying yourself by then reporting that gun lost or stolen to police? I mean, it makes no sense. Much like Caston's latest proposal. According to the Daily Herald, in interviews and forums, Caston has noted that there are more guns in the U.S. than people, and far more than any other nation. But a hard count isn't possible because no official record-keeping system for firearm ownership in the U.S. exists. Regardless, he says, what we need to talk about is that we have too many guns. And he pointed to Australia uh, as a nation that he says has taken positive action on gun control. So back in 1996, the Port Arthur massacre happened in Australia. And as a response, the Australian government said, we're going to ban many commonly owned firearms. And they, they did. And they held what most media calls a buyback. But what I call a compensated confiscation program, because that's really what it is. You are told, hand over your guns or you become a criminal. And in exchange for you cooperating with our demand, we'll give you a little bit of cash. Basically, in many cases, pennies on the dollar for what these guns were worth. Now, Sean Caston doesn't talk about the fact that in Australia right now, there are more guns in privately owned hands than there were in 1996 when Australia's gun ban took place. Yeah. In fact, gun control advocates in Australia have been calling for another compensated confiscation program because they said, people will keep buying these guns. We put up all of these barriers. We put up all of these hurdles. We said no. We tried to make it taboo to own guns. Damn it, people keep buying them. We got to have another one of these things. So even in Australia, by the way, the buyback... Uh, has not worked the way that gun control advocates intended it to work. And it has not cut down on the number of fires because now there are more guns in Australia in privately owned hands than there were back in 1996. So keep all that in mind. But Kasten says, uh, quote, they took a bunch of guns out of circulation. They haven't had a mass shooting since. Why don't we do that? Well, they they actually have. They they have not had a mass shooting with the uh, number of fatalities as the Port Arthur massacre but there have been mass shootings in Australia since then. I, you know, it, it, this, is, this is what drives me crazy. Sean Kasten seems to be trying to build his career on gun control, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. If you're going to try to be the gun control expert in Congress, you should probably have a basic command of the facts. Instead, he's simply trying to build his uh, you know, uh, resume off of Stale and tired talking points. Bumper sticker slogans. Daily Herald says, uh, Kasten said Australian leaders used money as an incentive because they realized that reducing the number of privately owned guns would be, quote, extremely difficult. He says, would it work exactly the same way adapted to U.S. culture? I don't know. My interest right now is less about how to do that particular policy and more about let's start having the conversation. Will we'll representative... One of the first things that's going to come up when you have this conversation is how do you do it? So you better be thinking about how this is going to work. And by the way, Australia's rate of gun ownership far below that of the United States. How many guns does Representative Kasten want to take off of the streets, quote unquote, actually out of your homes and your gun safes? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. He uh, does apparently believe that Engaging in some sort of compensated confiscation program would cut down on the number of suicides in this country. So we're not going to fix that with background checks or assault weapon bans. Let's find a way to have fewer guns. How many? How many is fewer? What, 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 would, what would Sean Cassidy be satisfied with? Right now, the estimates are we got about 400 million firearms in private hands. What does he want to bring that number down to? 300 million? Uh, that probably seems like too much for Sean Cassidy. Two hundred million, a hundred million, fifty million, ten million, five million, a million. I don't know. By the way, Sean Caston, during this entire interview, 
I don't think mentioned and he's it doesn't sound like he was asked anything at all about the fact that Americans are buying guns right now in record numbers. The National Shooting Sports Foundation estimates that as many as 5 million Americans have already become gun owners since January 1st of this year. I don't think they purchased those firearms saying that they were short-term rentals. I don't think they, they thought that they were getting a lease on a new Glock. They bought that. And they plan on keeping it. But again, this is a fundamentally unserious idea from a fundamentally unserious politician. I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that you may remember clicking around in the back of your brain. That name sounds familiar. See if this headline rings a bell. It's from late August. Representative Sean Caston, small genitals, not sufficient reason to own a gun. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the type of in depth analysis that uh, that we can expect from Representative Sean Caston here. He went on a uh, Twitter rant against fragile masculinity. Mm-hmm. After facing backlash for comments he made blaming gun ownership on small genitals, he was doing an online uh, a forum with students, and he said, quote, If you're a constitutional originalist, unless you're a member of a well-regulated militia, tell me why you need to own a gun. Having small genitals is not a sufficient reason to own a gun. Yeah. Well, again, Sean Kasten's wrong about the history of the Second Amendment. Um. I've I've talked about this on several occasions, but I'm going to go through it again just briefly here. You want to find out what the founders thought about the right to keep and bear arms? I mean, obviously, we can look at the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be in France. Yes, they do mention one of the reasons for the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. But it's the right of the people to keep and bear arms that shall not be in France. And you can look at other contemporaneous documents, the 1776 Pennsylvania State Constitution, the 1790 Pennsylvania State Constitution, which was a, a more moderate uh, state constitutional measure. Uh, you can look at the instructions from New Hampshire delegates to the Constitutional Convention, uh, in which they talked about the, the right of the people to keep their arms, not related to a militia. You can look at the language of several state constitutions where they talk about in defense of yourself and the state. And again, these are contemporaneous with the Bill of Rights. But you can also look at Federalist 46, which was written by James Madison during the debate over the ratification of the Constitution. And one of the big concerns at the time was that this big, powerful federal government would turn into a tyrannical regime. And Madison's point was, he had several points in Federalist 46. Lay now why he didn't think that that was the case. But he said, look, Let's say that it happens. I don't think it's going to happen, but let's say that it happens. And now you've got some tyrannical federal government. He said, quote, Let a regular army fully equal to the resources of the country be formed, and let it be entirely at the devotion of the federal government. And still it would not be going too far to say that the state governments with the people on their side would be able to repel the danger. He said the highest number to which, according to the best computation, a standing army can be carried in any country does not exceed one hundredth part of the whole number of souls or one twenty fifth part of the number able to bear arms. This proportion, he said, would not yield in the United States an army of more than twenty five or thirty thousand men. To these would be opposed a militia amounting to near a half a million citizens with arms in their hands, officered by men chosen from among themselves, fighting for their common liberties, and united and conducted by governments possessing their affections and confidence. He said it may well be doubted whether a militia thus circumstanced could ever be conquered by such a proportion of regular troops. Those who are best acquainted with the last successful resistance of this country against the British arms will be most inclined to deny the possibility of it. And he says, besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans <coughs> possess over the people of almost every other nation. Again, he's not now talking about besides the ability to join a militia. No. Besides the advantage of the American people being armed, which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any form can admit of. Notwithstanding the military establishments in these several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear, the governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. Again, the people with arms. 
And what's Madison's point? Over there in Europe, governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. Not here. Here, the people have a right to bear arms. And he said, uh, it's not certain that with this aid alone, they would be able to shake off their yokes, but were the people to possess the additional advantages of local governments chosen by themselves who could collect the national will, direct the national force, and of officers appointed out of the militia by these governments and attached both to them and to the militia, it may be affirmed with the greatest assurance that the throne of every tyranny in Europe would be speedily overturned in spite of the legions which surround it. Let us not insult the free and gallant citizens of America with the suspicion that they would be less able to defend the rights of which they would be in actual possession than the debased subjects of arbitrary power would be to rescue theirs from the hands of their oppressors. So, Madison, writing in favor, by the way, of ratifying the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Madison, at that point, didn't think a Bill of Rights was necessary, but he ultimately lost that fight. Was still talking about, even before the Second Amendment was a thing, even before the Bill of Rights was a thing. Madison was talking about the right of the people to bear arms and how, if need be, the armed populace of the United States could be channeled into militias that would serve their local governments, their state governments, and that would fight against a tyrannical federal government. So it wasn't only that the right of the people existed so they could join a militia, but because Americans possessed the advantage of being armed. That was an option if tyranny ever were to form. Representative Caston gets it entirely backwards. And it's a shame because uh, the first term Democrat, I mean, he, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not an expert on Illinois politics, but he's, uh, you know, got a good shot at winning reelection based off of nonsense like this. So I tell you what I'm going to do. You know, he said he wants to have, he wants to start a conversation. We'll see. We'll see what conversation uh, Representative Kasson's willing to have. Because I'm going to invite him to be a guest here on Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Because I think it's important that Sean Kasson not just be allowed to repeat these bumper sticker slogans without any pushback whatsoever from uh, journalists who frankly don't know the ins and outs of this issue. If, if this is something that Sean Caston is basing his campaign around and basing his time in Congress around, then he needs to talk with somebody who actually knows a little bit about this issue. And I hope it's going to be me, because I'm going to extend the invite. Get ready, Congressman. All right, let's uh, move on now to our good deed of the day, our armed citizen story, uh, as well as our recidivist report. We're going to start there. Uh, that is uh, Sean Holliday uh, there. He's accused of shooting his pregnant girlfriend in the head. Uh, in an apartment while he was uh, out on probation. Yeah, the uh, Enterprise newspaper in uh, Brockton, Massachusetts, says that uh, Holiday has agreed uh, to um, uh, being dangerous. He's stipulated to being dangerous. He's now being held without bail uh, in this case. But honestly, why was this guy out on the streets to begin with? Buried in this article in the Enterprise News uh, is the fact that um, uh, Holiday was on probation at the time, was actually wearing a GPS monitoring bracelet uh, as part of his probation. Why was he on probation? Well, this particular story doesn't actually say, but I, I did go back and I looked through some additional uh, news stories and I found out that Holiday was placed on three years probation back in December of last year after he was convicted of trafficking fentanyl. In Massachusetts. Yeah, you know the opioid that's uh, killing a ton of people around the United States? Yeah. Holiday was convicted not of possessing fentanyl, but of trafficking fentanyl and got three years probation for that crime. His probation initially scheduled to end after three years uh, and, in fact, a, a warrant for his arrest, uh, was issued on September the 9th for a GPS violation when the battery on his GPS device went dead. Probation uh, spokesperson couldn't say when that monitoring bracelet died, 
But uh, apparently it wasn't working uh, when he was uh, uh, allegedly in his uh, girlfriend's apartment and shot her in the head. So not only should this guy have been behind bars, but again, when, when, when he violates his own probationary terms and just lets that batter in the GPS monitoring device die, what happens? There's no, you know, all points bulletin that's put out. It's not like police are immediately going to go and go grab him. No. Put out a warrant and they see him, they'll pick him up. In this case, unfortunately, that didn't happen until after he allegedly shot his pregnant girlfriend, Sean Holiday, there in Brockton, Massachusetts, the subject of today's recidivist report. Our uh, armed citizen story of the day from Washington State. I'm sure that Governor Jay Inslee is just horrified of the fact that there are people who are still acting in self defense with a firearm uh, there in Washington State. But uh, uh, there you go. I reached over and got my shotgun and I cocked it. Grandma fins off would be burglar. From uh, KIRO in Seattle, Washington, a story out of uh, Spanaway, Washington, 78-year-old woman held an intruder at gunpoint after finding the man breaking into her home. woman goes by the name of Sandy, knew something was wrong. She said when her dog Boo Boo started barking on Sunday night, she said, I opened my door, standing two, three in front of me was a man. We looked at each other for a few seconds, and he turned and he started to leave, and I said, oh, no, you don't. You stay right there. Now, th- that could have been said very friendly. Oh, no, you don't. You stay right there. I'm going to go get you a piece of pie. I don't think that's what Sandy was talking about. Sandy said her neighbor has been plagued by crime recently, resulting in her car being broken into twice. And she said when she came face to face with the intruder, she was not about to let him run away. She said, I reached over and I got my shotgun. And I cocked it and I told him to stay right there. I told him to go sit on the steps. I followed him out. I just stood there with a the shotgun waiting for the police to come. I love it. First time, by the way, that Sandy's ever had to use that shotgun. She said she got it years ago when she was a single mom. She said she was initially scared to death while she was holding the uh, would-be intruder at gunpoint. She said, then I was totally calm, really and truly. She said, I, I, I thought, this is amazing. You know, I've got grandchildren your age. Yeah. She asked him why he tried to break in and uh, was alarmed because he said he was looking for his wife and talked about how God had sent him. Yeah, I, I, I think God probably would have given him the right address. Deputies arrested the suspect, said it's all thanks to Sandy's quick thinking and bold actions. She says she's grateful that nobody, including the intruder, got hurt. She said after he was so meek and mild and sat down like I told him to do, she said it was empowering. I felt like at least I was in charge. I was not afraid. Good for her. Sandy able to uh, protect herself from that would-be intruder. Sandy's a little bit more gracious than I am because she decided not to actually press charges. I don't think I would have gone that far, but uh, Sandy, good for you. Finally, our good deed of the day from the Chicago suburbs. WGN reporting on a police officer saving a 14-year-old boy who's trapped in a house fire in Lyle, Illinois. Officer Bill Wise, first on the scene of the uh, multifamily blaze about 10.30 Tuesday evening, he said, I got out of my squad car. People were telling me there was a kid trapped in the basement. He said, I sprinted up to the house. I could hear the kid yelling for help. He knocked on the front door. Flames and smoke there. He said, I could see the kid's hand and arms poking out of the window well there in the basement. And so he uh, went around to the side of the house. He said he was extremely composed. Obviously, he was frightened, but he was able to yell clear enough for me to get to him. He was trapped by an air conditioning unit, apparently, that was there in the basement. Uh, Wise tried to break through a window cover to get in. He says, I was able to lift it high enough up so the kid could wiggle out uh, of the window well. He then carried the 14-year-old to a waiting ambulance. WGN reports that neighbors who watched it all said the officer is a bona fide hero. Neighbor uh, Evelina Conietti said, I know that he saved this boy's life. It's pretty amazing. Officer Wise and the uh, teenager both taken to the local hospital to be treated for smoke inhalation, both going to make a, a full recovery and in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Officer Bill Wise there in Lyle, Illinois, we thank you, sir, for your very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, don't forget, if you like what you hear and see here, please feel free to share it with strangers, friends, family members, whoever you think could benefit. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Bearing Arms Cam and Company on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. You can also subscribe to Town Hall Media at YouTube, and that way you'll never miss a program as well. Uh, working on a uh, follow-up to a story we've got uh, at Barry Arms right now about a nine-year-old boy in Louisiana suspended from school because his teacher saw briefly a BB gun during a virtual class session. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to talk with the uh, family 
on tomorrow's Cam and Company. We are working hard to make that possible. But I know we'll be back regardless with the latest Second Amendment news and information from all around the nation. In the meantime, be well, be safe, be free, and we'll see you soon with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company.